Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Wise Decision Maker Show, where we help you make the wisest and most profitable decisions. As always, my name is Dr. Glad Sapursky. I'm the CEO of Disaster Avoidance Experts, the future of work consultancy that sponsors the Wise Decision Maker Show. And today with me here is Wendy Hamilton, the CEO of TechSmith. We'll find out what TechSmith does later. But first, Wendy, I wanted you to tell me about the new research that was just released by TechSmith about your experiment with no meetings and how that worked out for you. So tell me a little bit about the context, what made you decide to do it, what you actually did, and what were the outcomes? Sure. Well, thank you, Dr. Gleb, for having us. Yes, uh, we've been uh, listening closely to our employees, and we heard a lot of frustration uh, with meetings. It's probably ubiquitous <laughs> frustration uh, that has happened for many years. Uh, you know, specifically, all participants of meetings didn't feel like they needed to be there, and sometimes the meetings were just at inconvenient times where people thought there were other high priority work to do or interrupted them from co high concentration tasks. So we set out with that ambitious goal to go without synchronous meetings for a month mm -hmm. um, and really pushed and adopted an asynchronous culture that you know relied heavily on technology uh, for asynchronous communication, uh, like messaging platforms, as well as screen capture software. And what it enabled folks to do is is to share information um, at a time that worked for them and have other people mm -hmm consume the information and comment on the information at the time that that worked for them. Uh, what we found is that 85% uh, of employees felt that they could replace meetings uh, with asynchronous mm -hmm. communication. And we saw a 15% um, productivity improvement measured mm -hmm. by the number of employees who felt highly productive had improved. Excellent. Now tell me a little bit about the kind of challenges that managers faced with a lack of meetings. I can imagine uh, consulted for many, many companies on managing hybrid work, remote work, in-office work, and managers are usually the ones who want meetings more than the employees. So what has been the experience of managers and how have they navigated these challenges? Sure, well, what is important to clarify is nobody does these experiments expecting never to have a meeting again or no mm -hmm. meetings are valuable. Really, the most important part is to be more deliberate and intentional for both management and employees mm. about why they're having meetings and what they seek to gain from them. Um, and we also put a lot of emphasis on discussion of what the exception should be, and we wanted to learn mm. from that. You know, certainly we learned, and managers will tell you, if there's anything that needs to be discussed that's emotional or intense, don't try mm -hmm. to do that asynchronously. <laughs> um, you know, have a synchronous meeting, even better, a live in-person meeting. Mm -hmm. um, if there's anything where you're really trying to rally a high energy brainstorm and really a riff um, and get that going, that's also a situation where mm -hmm. our managers really feel they can do better work uh, with synchronous meetings, especially in-person meetings. Now, for other organizations that are thinking of, oh, maybe I want to try this out, how did you prepare for this month of experiment? Sure. Well, we are, um, our definition of experimentation is you have a hypothesis um, mm -hmm. that you're testing. You gather data before that hypothesis and after that hypothesis. And also, you should embrace failure, there's no such thing as mm. failure. You want to put people in the mindset that it's about learning and continuous improvement. Um, we're a high experimental culture. It's been a big mm. part of our culture. Um, but for organizations who aren't, there needs to be a lot of socialization about what you're really trying to achieve um, and what good looks like for a particular experiment. The good is always learning. Mm. Definitely. That's a very important part of experiments. Now, what has TechSmith learned? How will TechSmith be different after this experiment? I would say that I would have told you, maybe my own uh, ego bias is, we didn't have a lot of unnecessary meetings. We're not a hmm. huge uh, top-down management culture. It wasn't something management had to, to change. Um, however, like I said, 85% of employees felt they could reduce the number of meetings. 
So we learned something. And what we've really learned is giving employees more tools to make good decisions Mm -hmm. about having meetings and also give them ways to communicate, to inspire, to gather feedback, to inform without the need for a meeting. Um, It's very easy for people to simply record a PowerPoint, you know, even Mm -hmm. with their webcam and their face and their emotion with that voiceover and share that and allow people time to really consume that information. Maybe some people consume it at twice the speed. Some people listen to it over and over again, you know, before they comment on it and then gather all that feedback in one place. What you need to do is enable people to try things different ways. Mm -hmm. Um, That's how we think about this as opposed to a top-down management change. We're enabling Mm -hmm. staff to see what works for them, and we think it works better. Now, when I think about this experiment, reducing meetings, it seems that this will facilitate more distributed teams and more teams working remotely, maybe in a hybrid modality. What's your perspective on that? Well, part of why we did this is we are a hybrid shop. We have a Flex 20 work benefit. So right now, as part of continuing experimentation, we ask employees to come into the office just about 20% of their time. That's Mm -hmm. about our standard work practice. And this is after uh, going remote suddenly in in 2020, Mm -hmm. uh, which we weren't prepared for, but we survived and certainly made some mistakes along the way. Mm -hmm. Uh, We've only been a hybrid uh, since building our new office and moving in in October of last Mm -hmm. year, so not very long. Um, So what we're doing is we're both um, leveraging the in-office time deliberately Mm -hmm. um, and figuring out how to use that intentionally, while we're also still improving our skills to work remotely and work hybrid. And it takes a long time. You need to make a conscious effort at it. It definitely does. Uh, Like I said, I helped 21 companies by now transition, figuring out their long-term hybrid work arrangements. And about one day a week in the office is what I find most companies that I help adopt because that's enough for team collaboration, cohesion, those more intense conversations. That's the best thing to do in the office. Whereas at home, the best it's you know, having video conferences. You don't need to have a commute to come to the office to do video conferences. You're having synchronous meetings and you can do a lot of things asynchronously, email, the screen capture, and so on. And of course, just your own individual focused work. So the large majority of the time that workers are working is spent at home uh, in order to maximize productivity and engagement and retention. So how did you come to the Flex 20 yourself? I'm curious. Well, uh, we started uh, by listening to the employees and what mm-hmm. arrangement they thought would would make sense. Um, one day a week, or two days a week is the most common response mm-hmm. when we ask, what do you think your team needs? What do you think the company needs as a whole? That doesn't I mean, everyone agrees with it. You're never going to get 100% agreement on any uh, uh, work work policy, I, I think. Mm-hmm. But my idea was to listen to employees, meet them where they are, and then uh, monitor outcomes and develop a fact mm-hmm. base for how that's working. And everything's an experiment, um, including our, our 20, Flex 20 uh, policy and a few other things that we're doing. And we'll learn from it and we'll grow and we'll iterate as we need to. Tell me a little bit more about your perspective on hybrid work and remote work more broadly. You've seen a number of companies right now trying to force employees back to the office, and you're clearly not doing that. You're kind of taking the opposite approach. You're listening to employees as opposed to, let's say, Bob Iger coming into Disney and saying very from a top-down perspective, ignoring what employees want and saying, I want everyone back in the office for four days a week, or Elon Musk doing the same sort of things, leading from what they intuitively feel is the right thing rather than starting with the employees, which I always do when I consult with do a survey and some focus groups to see what employees want. And you're taking that approach. So what do you think is the difference between your approach? Why are you taking this approach of listening to employees versus others who are taking more of an authoritarian approach? <laughs> well, gosh, I, I really hate to, to try and comment on any particular CEO um, I'm asking you, know, you to comment on, on the approach difference. You're more sure, listening to employees. Sure. Others clearly are not. I mean, it's just <laughs> the approach. Yeah. I, look, I, w- I would say um, um, I feel that 
the way flexible work is often discussed in the press. It's either the mm -hmm. proletariat rising above their domineering, you know, bo boomer out of, out of touch boss only to, I don't know, qu quiet, quick and overwork, right? Um, overemployed, I guess is the term. Um, or um, the CEO is weaponizing return to office, maybe for some sort of loyalty test or some mm -hmm. sort of crafty payroll cost saving exercise. I I'm not sure. You know, what I, I will say, um, it it's complicated um, in, in both cases, in all cases, including ours, even though we've always been employee first company. And I think many companies that are employee first, a hundred percent retention still isn't the goal, right? Sure. If yes. you have, um, you know, you can't avoid employee conflict um, mm -hmm. for the benefit of one set of employees at the cost of another set of employees or your customers or your long-term sustainability. So my, my guess is maybe the difference is, um, who they're trying to ingratiate themselves with, you know, the, the politics and uh, maybe the co maybe the differences are trying to accelerate figuring out who's really motivated to be there at those companies. Hmm. Now, when we talk of, think about hybrid work, remote work, one of the challenges that my clients are finding is how do they build a effective culture as they're in tra transitioning to permanent hybrid work arrangements with most people coming on an average of one days a week, two days a week. What have you done to build effective culture as you're transitioning from that remote modality to this Flex 20 hybrid modality? Sure, I, th I think that's a great question. I, I think a lot about, and we think a lot about what type of culture creates long-term sustainable performance, not just short-term, you know, productivity statistics, but really what will make teams successful long-term. We have our theories about that, our hypotheses about mm -hmm. that, and we monitor those questions and that data very closely. Um, we saw, for instance, uh, when we looked at um, different cohorts of employees, that uh, unfortunately the employees that were hired full remote at the beginning of the COVID um, had some um, indicators that were concerns for us. Their relationships outside of their immediate team were not as strong. They indicated mm -hmm. they didn't necessarily have mentors or relationships with senior manager or relationships outside their department or best friends at work or didn't have fun at work. Those are all, you know, warning signs for us. Sure. So what we're really doing is some of this can be addressed remote and we're learning about how to how to do that. Uh, so the first five minutes of Zoom meeting, we try to make social time, you know, and, and fun time as, as an instance. Um, we're doing a virtual um, escape room uh, this month, you know, so we're trying to look so, for alternative uh, social practices that can be done uh, virtually. Um, but we're also really trying to consciously leverage that little bit of an office time where perhaps it's a little bit easier to, to create energy or create fun or to, even now I feel a little bit like a, a, a psychopath, Dr. Glove, because I can't look you in the eye, right? It's sort of hard. <laughs> we're figuring out how to do that. It's sort of hard to feel like you're making that connection sure. and really leverage that time. Don't have people come in the office to, to you know, have their earphones on all day, like create <laughs> Uh, we do free lunches and things like that mm -hmm. to create those social opportunities. So we're trying to um, be intentional about building up those places that we think are a little weak in our culture. Excellent. And do you do any remote social activities? I'll give you an example of something I work do with my clients, a couple of examples. One is a virtual water cooler. So any team of, let's say, six to eight people, the rank and file team, that's the usual span of control in their they, if you, they use Microsoft Teams or Slack, they create a channel for personal conversations. And every day they start the day by each person checking in at the start of their day as kind of the, the check-in, <laughs> daily check-in on how they're feeling right now, what's been going on in their personal life recently, what they're planning to focus on at work that day, then an interesting fact about themselves or the world that other people on their team may not know. And then they respond to three other people. And for the rest of the day, they can chat in that personal channel, but that's their morning check-in. So that we find really helps teams communicate and collaborate 
and become more human to each other. So humanizing each other to each other. So that's very helpful. So that morning check-in. And then another thing we do is virtual co-working where each day that for a hybrid team, let's say each day they're not coming to the office or if there are some fully remote folks each day, they dial into a video conference call for about an hour to work on their individual tasks with members of their six to eight people team. And so they start by sharing what they plan to work on. Then they turn off their microphones, they leave their speakers on and the video is optional. And then they work on their tasks. And as they come to a question, they have a question, they have an idea, they have a problem they want to solve. They share that with, turn on their microphone and share that. And then they chat with their team members. Maybe they do a screen share or something like that to address it. And then they stop chatting and they go on to do their work. And at the end, everyone shares what they worked on during this period. So we find this is very motivating for people. They save their most annoying work for this period. It helps teams bond and helps people get into the organizational culture. It's especially helpful for those junior team members to build those ties and address those weakened bonds with each other, as well as to get on the job training. So immediate answering to questions. Do you do anything like that? Do you think those might be helpful for you? I think those are fan fantastic ideas. Um, we definitely have uh, pods. Uh, we're, we're organized into small, small stable teams, our whole company that have adopted uh, some of those practices on their own, and they've been popular and spread through. So it wasn't uncommon for us even pre-COVID. We had a, a few mm. uh, full, full remote employees uh, that they would join their in-person team um, online a significant mm. part of the day and be there for each other. But what I really love about what you said is particularly the mentoring aspect of that. Mm. That is one of our biggest concerns of being hybrid. We're seeing mm. a lot of uh, new college grads, uh, Gen Z yeah. grads, were an entry-level hire, promote from within who want an in-office experience. And it's not a great in-office experience if no one else is in office, but, but them, sure. right? So we're trying to uh, f f figure that out. Um, mm -hmm. And part of that is, is social and relationships and those matters, but part of it is real mentoring, real learning. Mm -hmm. And how do you do that quickly as possible? Make sure people aren't stuck. So I, I really like that. Um, we don't quite have the formal um, messaging uh, check-in. We're a Slack shop, but we do have... Um, um, uh, OT channels, what we call off-topic mm -hmm. channels, and, and anybody is um, encouraged to create a, kind of an affiliate or interest channel. Um, mm -hmm. I'm in the electronic vehicles channel and the mm -hmm. dogs uh, channel. Um, there's a couch channel. I'm not in that. Um, so it's really, a, there's a travel channel, you know, so people can share some of their personal experience and make jokes and they can do that all day long or if they need a little stress mm -hmm. break. Nice. I would be in the cast channel. <laughs> <laughs> now, what kind of technology do you think is going to be really important to facilitate hybrid work going forward? Hmm. Oh, gosh, you're asking a, a vendor that makes technology for a hybrid I work. <laughs> um, I, I will say before I you know, talk about the role of video, which we love, mm -hmm. um, yes. Probably the bi the biggest thing um, I, I found interesting in our evolution was a, a trend towards uh, our in, you know our internal messaging platform, a, a corporate messaging pl platform. You know, pre COVID, we had complaints from employees of communication overload and platform mm -hmm. overload, and a big reason for that is managers and certainly senior leaders mostly used email. Mm -hmm. And engineers, which is the bulk of the company, mostly used instant messaging. Mm. Uh, so you had, for the engineers, you had two platforms to check. They both could be urgent. And it felt a little overwhelming. And we had to do yeah. a pretty big overhaul of our communication practices. And I'll say now, I only use email for external mm. Yeah, it was a big uh, cultural change for me. We're all, mm. you know, we're all the instant messaging. And there are a lot of reasons that that is um, helpful. And I don't know, may maybe the pendulum will swing and we don't like it anymore. And in five years, you know, you know how these things are, but that's very important. The part that um, you still need to, to do is a little bit more the the long form content sharing. And again, my talking over a PowerPoint and you watching it when you, you feel like it at the pace you want. Um, 
is far more helpful than me calling you into a meeting and making you sit there while your CEO sure. drones and drones on about her PowerPoint, right? Uh, so that's for the screen capture software yeah. and video editing software and that everyday kind of visual communication is very important for us. Um, and obviously we love our own tools, but we all weren't yeah. actually using our own tools. You know, now we have our... CFO, for instance, who's discovered it actually is better to do a screen capture to explain mm -hmm. a cash flow spreadsheet, <laughs> whereas before I'd always think you needed this meeting, you know, to kind mm -hmm. of walk through and, and point things out. It's actually not better for me because I never could follow what he was saying and interrupt him <laughs> 10 times. Anyway, this is this way I can, you know, watch at my own pace and double check a, a few other things and things like that. So there are has been a certain um, transformation that feels more empowering and improves clarity that is related to that technology adoption. And can you find, as we come to the end of our conversation, can you share how TechSmith has been helping its clients facilitate hybrid work? Oh, absolutely. We we love doing that. Uh, we, we live for our, our clients. Um, you know, we sell to every industry, can't you know, name an industry that, that we're not in. And it was so heartbreaking for us to watch what happened, you know, over COVID. You know, we um, especially serve um, higher education and corporate mm. trainers and people training um, what we call software adoption or customer education, people mm -hmm. training and supporting their software products. And they all were just crestfallen and stressed about how sure. they can serve their, their customers. And it was very partnering for us to help them during that, that transition, you know, help support, mm. communicate with development to escalate a bug or QA <laughs> to communicate to leadership, to change their priorities based on what something they were seeing um, that all became, you know, these short uh, software screencasts um, to really communicate the point. Um, flipped education, flipped learning. Oh, I could go on. I could go on forever. I, I love this stuff. But, um, you know, we help people get knowledge into video. Um, mm. Ultimately, that's that's what we do and we're very proud of that excellent any last words as we wrap up this conversation no i just wanted to uh thank you i really appreciate your um contributions and ideas and i will bring them back to mm -hmm. TechSmith. excellent well thank you very much for coming on and sharing your expertise with our listeners and viewers and thank the listeners and viewers for checking out another episode of the wise decision maker show please make sure to subscribe wherever you check us out and leave a review. It's very helpful for us to know what to do better and for other folks to discover the show. I look forward to seeing you in the next episode of the, of the Wise Decision Maker Show. In the meantime, the wisest and most profitable decisions to you, my friends.